Hello, I'm Richard Lowenberg, and uh, welcome uh, for tuning in to Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024. This is the uh, ninth of our laser Zoom, Leonardo laser Zooms. Um, today is Wednesday. We have three special guests for this program, and the topic, uh, the subtopic under the larger main theme, which is the nature of information. Today's uh, subject now is the ecological economics of information. I don't know if that's an appropriate title or not, but that's uh, where I, uh, what I threw out, and uh, the devil will be in the details. Uh, I want to uh, very quickly uh, cite the presenters we have with us. Uh, Rafael Arar, who is in Portland, Oregon, and uh, uh, Jaromil Denis Royal in Amsterdam, and uh, Vangelis Papadimitropoulos in Athens, uh, all variously involved in various aspects of our economic, financial, and uh, informational exchange uh, lives as we move forward, and especially as we look at the limits and uh, concerning aspects of existing powerful systems of financial exchange, economics, and so on. And I think uh, it's a very concerning, troubling, and yet uh, wide open area for new approaches to how we uh, structure our economic lives, our lives of sharing, of, uh, of uh, valuing, and so on. Um, I, 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 before we begin, I, uh, one of my favorite quotes by an economist, uh, I wanna just uh, recite this quote and uh, I don't know if any of you know who said this, but it, uh, it is, words ought to be a little wild, for they are the assault of thoughts upon the unthinking. Words ought to be a little wild, for they, they are the assault of thoughts upon the unthinking. Thank you, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's begin with Vangelis Papadimitropoulos, who's in Athens. He will introduce himself, give you a little bit of information as to who he is. I think he has a so short presentation. And uh, everybody will be doing short presentations, and then we will move into a discussion. Vangelis, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. I'm... Um, uh sharing my screen here right now um let me see how it works here clay okay there well we basically i brought up a, a presentation from my research project but i don't want to occupy the discussion with my research project it is just uh, handy I have it here, and so I brought it up. Uh, so I basically I'm a researcher. Um, I examine uh, at the commons, basically internet enabled commons based organizational models such as peer production, platform cooperatives, DAOs, and blockchain, etc. Uh, the research question of my work in the last uh, three years is the role of open source technologies and the digital commons in the creation of a uh, collaborative uh, economy. Uh, the theoretical framework is the one of uh, Michel Bounds and Vasilis Kostakis' model of open cooperativism and the uh, discourse theory of hegemony from Laclau and Mouffe a post-hegemonic uh, perspective on politics and theory and philosophy, etc. It goes along four axes, politics, economics, technology, ecology, 
the methodology is a multiple case study, was a multiple case study, peer-to-peer -peer labs, makers in Greece, open food network in Australia and globally, Cop cycle in France and uh, globally, and Circles UBI in uh, Germany. The goal was to examine the social innovation of the commons in the context of uh, the cooperative economy. A basic uh, element is uh, the concept, the notion of the commons. Uh, the commons consists of um, three basic elements, a common property resource, user communities, and the self-governance, commoning. There are multiple examples and types of uh, commons out uh, there, local commons, global commons, cosmolocal commons, uh, forests, nature, uh, software, hardware, whatever. Um, here you can see um, the basic elements of uh, the digital commons, of commons-based peer production on uh, the internet. Uh, it is about a mode of uh, production on uh, the e internet. Um, you can see the main features, uh, decentralization, uh, democratic uh, governance, uh, voluntary uh, democracy, stigmatism, modularity, transparency, value distribution and the rest and the like. Uh, we see these features also emerging in a cooperative uh, context, also partially in uh, in Ostrom's commons, in uh, anarcho-autonomous modes of uh, coordination, collaboration, uh, in collectives, uh, also some features of of uh, of it. You can see here a typology of uh, of the digital commons on uh, on uh, on the internet with some uh, representative uh, um, case uh, studies. Uh, most prominently, Apache, Lumio, WordPress, Linux, Mozilla. You know many of these. Mastodon, uh, Slashdot, Wikipedia, and the like. Bitcoin, etc. Arduino, uh, Wikihaus. There are hundreds out there. Uh, if not thousands, I don't know. Uh, we work on the concept of um, of open cooperativism that comprises uh, the model of cosmolocalism, designing global, the digital commerce, manufacturing local with hardware and means of production locally, commerce-based pre-production, multi-stakeholder governance between uh, the commons between ethical market entities that co-produce uh, or support uh, the commons and the partner state that supports uh, the model uh, via funding, infrastructures, licensing, uh, law, etc. on the basis of sustainability and the circular economy. Uh, you can see here um, um, the three-zone model, the structure of uh, the three-zone uh, model, um, and the main features of uh, the model. Uh, it goes along uh, three axes, ethical market entities, commons-based peer production, and the partner uh, state, as I said already. No need to go through all this in details. It will take uh, hours. Uh, you can see here some post-capitalist value flows. At the center, we have the commons, material and immaterial commons. Uh, civil society produces the commons. Uh, market, uh, ethical market entities add exchange value on top of the commons use value, and they, they produce income for the commons and for society as a whole. The state uh, supports the, common, the commons, the model of open cooperativism through taxes, grants, investment, etc. Um, now, the model of open cooperativism necessarily depends on, on capitalism. Uh, it, it buys input from, from capitalism and it sells uh, output on capitalism. The idea, the goal is to, to progress into post-capitalism where we have no surplus value and rent, no exploitation and uh, into a sort of um, interface with communism. 
So a sort of uh, interface between post-capitalism and communism, where communism is the production of the commons, of a gift economy, of re the regeneration of the stock flow of the commons that go into products and uh, incomes and uh, uh, commodities. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, some case studies in uh, of open cooperative with mean open source software. You can tell me when when you want me to stop because it's a, a, there are a, there are a lot of slides here with a lot of information. It's a three year research project, so you tell me whenever you want me to stop because it's a lot of stuff here to cover, and uh, I don't want to occupy the whole discussion with my research project. Okay. So it's up to you to notify me. And uh, let me just say, Benjil, um, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, you know we're looking at, and I, even this slide is quite appropriate. Um, let me uh, let me inter if I may, I'll just interject for those not familiar with this whole arena of commons-based uh, restructuring in a way of our societies. Um, a lot of this is based on the work, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, work of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, not alive anymore, but uh, she uh, her work was focused on common pool resources and the means to manage, govern, value, and such. Uh, so-called common pool resources, which most people, uh, and even Eleanor Ostrom, associated with uh, forests, wetlands, so-called natural resources, um, but also has a, a very important application to how we consider our information environment as it evolves now, uh, as, uh, and that uh, the commons is really a Maybe, uh, and, and please correct me if I misstate this, but uh, a, th a third sector. It's not the private sector. It's not the nonprofit public sector. It is the commons, an, uh, an arena that we all share in and uh, steward uh, together uh, to maintain uh, quality of life and uh, ability to um, have an economic relationship in our lives. Uh, is that correct, Vangelis? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I have classified the work of Eleanor Ostrom in the literature as a, a liberal version of of uh, of the commons. Uh, the polycentric model of uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, comprises the public uh, sector, the private sector, and the commons. It is a sort of uh, a liberal uh, version. The work of Ostrom is huge. We all build on the work on the footsteps of Eleanor Ostrom. <laughs> this, is, this is out of the question. Uh, however, um, the model of open cooperativism could be uh, an expansion, uh, a progression, an elaboration on the eighth design principle of, of, of uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Nested enterprises, it's a form of nesting. We build on how to nest the commons around the uh, coordination. Coordination between multiple actors. And um, also in my, in my, in my uh, interpretation and, uh, and, and assessment of the work of Fostrom, uh, we try to touch upon uh, also on the power relations th uh, 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 that Ostrom um, somehow I think uh, doesn't take uh, didn't take into account. Uh, uh, she didn't criticize uh, capitalist relations of production, and uh, also the exploitative nature of the state per se. So we try to somehow radicalize uh, Ostrom in a more uh, post-liberal, uh, post-capital uh, direction. This is, uh, in a nutshell, uh, how we approach the work of Ostrom. Also, Ostrom uh, take take her bearings from uh, from Hayek, from um, uh, from uh, different uh, liberal authors that. Um, have different bearings on 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 Austrian economics, on uh, public choice theory, 
we try to to combine also other aspects of political theory, post-Marxism, the work of Laclau and Mouffe. We try somehow to reconcile liberalism with Marxism. This is in short what I try to do with my work. Uh, I try to reconcile uh, liberalism with Marxism so as to um, provide an overlapping consensus and mutual advantage between multiple players that want to interact in a more democratic, more ecological, more diverse, more sustainable, more fair society and economy, regardless of ideology, of class, of gender, of uh, whatever. Thank you. Um, yes, I think in this program, we're uh, especially focused on the so-called information environment, which is uh, all pervasive, essentially. Uh, and actually, information is one definition of uh, currency, uh, the means for exchange. Um, and so uh, if you'd like, you can continue with your presentation. Uh, I think it's quite appropriate. Okay, you can see here the difference between neoclassical economics and commons-based economics, where on the, the, on the one hand, the main principles are individualism, utility maximization, perfect knowledge, which is not perfect, perfect competition, which is not perfect, private property, scarcity, supply and demand equilibria, exchange of value commodities and the like. On the other hand, we have a diversity of motivations, knowledge is open, uh, sharing is prevalent, all of this is necessary, transparency. We have win-win games, we have a combination of rights, a scarcity combines with abundance, we strive for open supply chains, open logistics, open protocols, a circular economy, a gift economy, the satisfaction of use value of social needs, and models of degrowth, post-growth, and uh, eco-sufficiency. You can see here a potential transition, perhaps, among others, from a capitalist enterprise to an open uh, cooperative. The problem with traditional and platform cooperatives is, is that they do not produce commons. Uh, in our view, in my view, uh, they do not produce uh, commons, so they have a problem to, uh, to compete with uh, capitalism in terms of the commons. Open cooperatives can be more competitive in terms of costs, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, production, transaction, uh, coordination costs, but of course they have uh, several problems that is not uh, at the time to touch on uh, these problems, perhaps a bit later. Uh, you can see here two different models uh, today, uh, political economic models, the one of green growth and the other of post-growth. Uh, uh, it's too much information here, too much uh, context and content. I cannot go through all this in detail, so let me move on. Yeah, the research hypothesis in our work is that um, the model of open cooperativism, common in, can result in a constantly improving collective repository of knowledge, of best ideas, of practices, of resources that can all culminate in social innovation and democratization. And uh, ethical market entities, be it cooperative, social enterprises, or whatever, that have access to commons gain a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis closed proprietary models. So perhaps capitalism is forced in the future to adapt to post-capitalism and to satisfy the classical principle from each according to her capacity to each according to her needs. You can see here the advantages of open cooperativism vis-a-vis uh, -vis extractive uh, capitalism, democratization, the production of commons, of knowledge commons, of free information, of uh, multi-stakeholder, uh, distributed, decentralized governance, value distribution, social innovation spillovers from anti-rival network effects, uh, thermodynamic flows of matter and energy, sustainability, improved work quality, freedom, uh, justice, equality, resilience, and the like. But there are several problems, of course, uh, I, I, I will touch uh, on some of these here. Um, <clears throat> 
traditional and platform cooperatives alone uh, cannot defeat capitalism for various for a lot of reasons uh, money capital uh, resources etc politics lobbying and all that stuff so we propose the transformation of uh, traditional and platform uh, cooperatives into open cooperatives but open cooperatives have the problem that uh, the tragedy of the commons they produce commons so everybody can take the commons and make money out of it and exploit the commons and co-opt the commons this is the so-called tragedy of the commons that Eleanor Ostrom uh, most famously addressed in her work uh, also the commons bear significant production transaction and coordination costs uh, so we advocate here for Ostrom's design principles for closed loops of uh, cross-sectoral value chains, for copy fair licenses to protect the commons. Uh, we advocate for openness within the model of open cooperativism and trade outside the model of open cooperativism with uh, ethical market entities into a model of post-capitalism. Um, of course, the economist uh, will tell me that, uh, okay, you can have 1,000 cooperatives, 2,000 cooperatives, they can produce commons, as many commons as you, as you want, but still, capitalism can price you out. They can work, uh, they can go, uh, they can uh, uh, sell, uh, uh, they can go, how to say it, they can sell below the, the price of the market, they can have losses like Uber did for the last years and they can price you out eventually. So, yes, in this regard, uh, we foresee some scenarios of potential social transformation, many small victories, many small victories that can scale wide in the future or a big uh, victory in the digital commons with network effects that can also disrupt uh, the main uh, incumbents in the market and the big political victory, whatever it may means, and in combination uh, with these and other scenarios. Now, there are many cases of, of, of um, cosmolocalism, of uh, hardware, of software out there, of the commons um, spanning uh, different sectors of the, of the economy from housing, robotics, biohacking, prosthetics, uh, a, a lot of uh, stuff out there. And now I, I think it's not uh, uh, convenient now to, to go into the case studies because I have four case studies and it's a lot of uh, details and information. I think I, 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 I don't know, I, I could stop here or I may progress a bit further. Let me see if I can share something that is somehow meaningful here. The format is not good here. So I, I think, Vangelis, a, a few on the ground examples would be very helpful for people to understand some of this. So we could, we might show a few of these, uh, just probably not all because there is a lot of depth and diversity to this. But examples would be very helpful, I think, for those tuning in here who really are not familiar with this whole concept of uh, the commons, common pool resources and platform cooperatism. Yeah, Jewmakers is one case study in Greece. Uh, they are inspired by Farmhack and L'Atelier Paysan in, in, uh, in France. Um, they deploy the digital commons on the internet and the hardware uh, in a fab lab uh, to to produce uh, open source agricultural uh, tools. <clears throat> they are a community of uh, farmers, of researchers that come together in workshops and they uh, produce uh, together uh, agricultural uh, tools. They have produced thus far uh, 13 agricultural uh, tools. Uh, you can see here a discourse analysis with some concepts and the practices uh, that uh, they, they apply. Um, the value proposition is sustainability, technological sovereignty. They create open source agricultural tools. They, they advocate for open source agriculture. 
uh, they produce on demand uh, low cost tools for uh, uh, for uh, farmers in the mountains uh, they get money from grants they do workshops they are transparent the governance model is the one of participatory design they go they get together and they design together the the tools the, the designs are, are are open on the internet in uh, depositories, different depositories. They apply democratic uh, uh, models, multi-stakeholder governance. They have progressed uh, recently into a non-profit uh, association. Then they, comp they, they comprise a diversity of legal entities. And I think we can see here that um, we can state that they, they innovate in terms of uh, in the in the in the field of open source agric agriculture in terms of commoning sustainability sustainability they promote the model of cosmolocalism they have progressed in the multi stakeholder association there are challenges of course there is still low demand and slow demand and low and slow scalability uh, there is a lack of uh, cross-sectoral value chains. They need to connect into other uh, sectors of the economy to create an ecosystem to connect the, the value chains and the supply chains in different sectors, from uh, agriculture to logistics to energy to whatever. So they 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 have a, they they pose a weak counter hegemony at uh, the moment. So I think uh, I could stop here. I don't know, whatever you want. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to these when we, uh, after our other presentations and as we enter discussions, uh, one of the things I'd like to bring up later, I, I'm already thinking about lots of uh, comments and questions, especially um, this program is about art and science, uh, very generally. Um, there's so much more going on in the world of art and technology. And uh, one of the big issues I have is that most of our technological development is driven by consumer capitalism and the speed at which and the need for continuous growth, uh, as well as ownership and uh, other aspects of that whole dilemma. And maybe later uh, we'll talk a bit about the whole development of technolo you know, technological development within all of this uh, and how uh, humans as tool makers, uh, how our technologies might evolve differently under a different political economic kind of uh, almost what I would call usually uh, earth economics. You know, uh, if we're really talking about sustainability, our, our, our values, our exchanges, all are really based on both the extents and limits of this lovely little planet we live on. Uh, and so um, with that, I'd like to open it up to uh, Rafael Arar. All right, I will start sharing my screen. Actually. Everything coming through okay? Yes. Great. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Rafael Arar. Um, I've been fascinated by systems for a long time. And over the years, I've sought out opportunities to uncover transdisciplinary ways to make sense of them, um, usually with an eye towards intervening within them for positive social impact. So my journey has really placed me at the intersection of art, design, and research, and I found a niche in R&D spaces navigating complex and ambiguous problems. So whether through speculative design, discursive design, or research-based art practice, I've leveraged a hybrid background as a through line uh, using these tools to raise new questions and shed light on critical topics. So while economics has been a brewing interest, uh, it's taken me some time to tackle it head on. Um, and I think the pursuit really emerged from applying art and design tools to social systems, as I always strove to understand the root causes of their outputs. 
So in the enterprise space, I explored the mechanics of technological acceleration at both Apple and IBM, which sparked curiosity about the educational system that shapes modern companies and their productivity tools. Delving into education at the global nonprofit Khan Academy, I quickly learned that the economic system that produced it spawned lopsided advantages based on class privilege. And so I can post-rationalize my trajectory as this continuous quest to tackle root causes, which inevitably led me to the Marxian perspective and the notion that our political economy is the driving force behind technology, social, and societal impact. It's kind of the system of all systems from my perspective. And so drawing on a background in cybernetics and an interest in system dynamics, I've relied on Donald Meadows' framework of leverage points or places to intervene in a system as kind of a personal guiding compass. Um, and in this framework, the, the paradigms and the power to transcend them actually stand as points of highest leverage. And so for these paradigm shifts to occur, um, I believe we must consider how information manifests and is metabolized in the economy, um, both as it exists, but also how it's presented to us. And so this perspective leads me to argue that our economic system is less of a deterministic machine and more of a biological organ. And like a living system, it processes information through interrelated subsystems and fractals uh, that produce both predictable, uh, but also erratic outcomes. And so understanding the organic nature of information flow is really crucial to envisioning and implementing paradigm shifts in our economic thinking. So in the next set of minutes, I'll share some of the aesthetic, speculative, and pragmatic approaches that I've explored, uh, sometimes alone and sometimes collaboratively, uh, to affect change. And while very much imperfect, uh, these avenues have helped me at least offer a different perspective on political economy um, by both exposing gaps in the current system, as well as highlighting or imagining some of the alternatives. So capitalism in its present form has really become so ubiquitous that it often fades into the background of our daily lives. It's a system that can overwhelm us, which makes the process of tackling it head on um, nearly impossible, um, except I might argue in the speculative space. And so it's been both in these aesthetic and speculative spaces that I've attempted to make visible some of our current economic systems, hidden dynamics and consequences. And so the projects I'll share aim to provoke thought and discussion about capitalism's nature, uh, its impact on our lives, its relationship with our environment, and how some of its subterranean characteristics and implicit ways of extracting knowledge and elucidating information affect us at a visceral level. So time, as we know it, is the capitalist construct. And this piece called a capitalist clock segments aspects of our invisible digital labor as units of time and reinforces the tight coupling of time and money in order to raise awareness of some of our exploited online actions. See, every click, like, favorite, bookmark, reply, or search is an act of work capitalism ignores, uh, but leverages for profit. And so the piece comprises exposed electronics, uh, a solenoid, an LCD readout, and a microcontroller that drives its operating mechanics. Um, it pulls a tweet or post uh, from X, <laughs> what well, was formerly called Twitter, and reinforces, um, pulls a tweet or post that actually references a time money idiom, which fires a motor uh, that displays the text on this LCD readout. Um, so a time money idiom might be something like, in, in my free time, uh, that was time well spent. It stores it in a queue and ends up firing these off. And so it pays homage to the aesthetics of time card clocks and seeks to exhibit a kind of minute component of the invisible labor of social media that indirectly tries to raise, um, tries to catalyze a form of consciousness raising about how much some of our actions are valued and processed in the digital age. And so here are just some of the methods uh, that that happens. 
So on the speculative side of things, this installation, uh, which you see a photo of here called an ecological oracle, um, attempts to turn the gallery into a microcosm of the social dynamics at play in light of our impending climate catastrophe. Um, so the piece was exhibited at the Science Gallery Detroit, uh, which is now the Michigan State University Museum, and attempted to engage participants in a game-like form where they needed to self-organize in order to maintain uh, the system's dynamic equilibrium. So the work centers on uh, this physical component, which are two beakers that represent the available water supply and glacial melt. And there's a peristaltic pump that transfers water between these two beakers based on the spatial environment's social dynamics. So the beaker on the left labeled R is the reservoir, the beaker on the right, uh, labeled M, is the glacial melt beaker. And nested within it is a smaller beaker of red dyed liquid, which um, serves as a metaphor for like the kind of aggregate of all the tipping points. And I'll explain how that works in just a moment. So the system monitors the number of individuals and total audible value, volume in the space uh, that serve as proxies for urbanization and noise pollution. And these inputs end up affecting the water flow um, that can potentially trigger an undesirable regime shift if kind of this tipping point of the space is reached. So at some point, um, if there are too many participants or things are too chaotic for the way the system was calibrated, the water in the melt beaker ends up getting to a level where it starts to mix with the red dyed liquid. And so there's a multimedia visualization that accompanies the physical component that shows real-time effects on a representation of Earth. Uh, so this is it in its kind of regenerative state, if you will, um, where it's within limits. And then this is it, what happens when the tipping point is reached. Um, and so when that tipping point is reached, the game is essentially over because the red dyed liquid mixes with the whole water supply and any attempt to move things back to equilibrium um, is futile. Um, so the, the piece is intended to serve as this parable of the kind of social dynamics that are at play in light of combating climate change uh, that prompts questions um, about things like the role of the individual versus the collective, how do we collaborate, um, and how do we actually apply long-term thinking in complex systems. So having explored the limitations and contradictions of the current system, I'll now turn to alternatives. And so these projects range from aesthetic provocations to speculative models, and um, even the start of some pragmatic implementations. And so each that I'll share offers a unique perspective on how we might uh, reimagine our economic system in more goals-based and values-aligned kind of ways. So your money is no good here is the PCC, uh, which is essentially an inverse vending machine of alternative economic models and anti-capitalist strategies, um, all of which attempt to abandon currency and monetary approaches. Uh, it, it's a piece that subverts, subverts capitalist icons to expose alternative economic models to participants. Uh, so the interaction model is quite simple. Um, participants enter a coin, which is immediately returned. And there's a receipt printer at the top of this piece that produces a slip that says your money is no good here with a QR code. That QR code will lead you to information about a random non-monetary economic model. So the piece pays homage to imagery such as the piggy bank, the vending machine, and the ATM in an attempt to thwart expected interactions and elucidate some of the alternative structures. Um, and it really serves to make a small dent in the notion that anything can be bought by encouraging participants to explore some of the non-monetary economic systems that have either been tried or in are currently being tried or have just been imagined. So many theoretical visions of alternatives to capitalism have also yet to be realized. And when many think of economic planning, they often think of the Soviet Union or socialism with Chinese characteristics. However, there's an entire category of robust models that have been imagined that fall into the category of distributed economic, distributed planning processes or democratic economic planning. 
And so I've been exploring these models and engaging with the quote unquote planning community uh, to better understand them. And in the process, I've started to diagram some of the mechanics which center on how goals are set, needs get communicated, and information is ultimately metabolized. Um, so here's the first diagram in this series, uh, which is a depiction of how economists and computer scientists Paul Cockshot and Alan Cottrell uh, think of the planning process working out in their model for what is often referred to as cyber communism, uh, really taking the, the kind of failures of the Soviet Union in the planning process and actually thinking how computational power can help realize them with a slightly more democratic and distributed bend. Then there's negotiated coordination, uh, a model from Pat Devine and Fikret Adaman, which is less computationally assisted and in fact is not computationally assisted, um, but centers more on conscious political deliberation and a lot of discussion. And then there's the probably the most well-known of the lot, which is participatory economics um, from economists and political scientists, Robin Honnell and Michael Albert, uh, which centers on worker and consumer councils in this iterative planning process. So by extension, I've considered the kind of speculative software uh, that might support their realization as perhaps an effort to both make sense of them, just kind of the way my brain works, uh, but also highlight some of the potentially problematic or bizarre uh, areas of them. Um, and in effect serve as these like uh, catalysts for future discourse or conversation starters. Um, so this interface here and this one are both for um, trying to think through how a planning application might work for participatory economics. Whereas this set uh, corresponds to a relatively new model uh, called digital socialism, or often referred to as Amazon socialism from economist Daniel E. Saros, which centers on infrastructure called the general catalog, um, which you could consider like an amazon.com or a Craigslist for economic planning. So while speculative models offer some valuable thought experiments, uh, pragmatic approaches demonstrate how alternative economic systems may already exist or might be implemented in real world contexts. And so the examples I'll share with you now showcase the potential for community driven, democratically controlled economic structures that um, seek to prioritize social and environmental well being over profit maximization. So here's a diagram outlining the work of Cooperation Jackson, uh, a grassroots initiative in Jackson, Mississippi focused on building economic democracy through cooperative enterprise and some of the components of their Jackson Cush plan. Um, so it's been exciting to learn that many of these elements are in practice at varying degrees of fidelity and varying degrees of success, uh, but do consist of some share of the economic relations in West Jackson, Mississippi, where uh, uh, the community is based. There's also the Boston Ujima Project, uh, who create and operate the first democratically run investment firm, um, one that is now somewhat nationally renounced amongst the US movement space. And here's a diagram outlining how that uh, democratically run investment firm uh, operates. Uh, then there's the model of Rojava, uh, a self-governing region in Northern Syria that champions direct democracy, gender equality, and ecological sustainability, uh, an effort to uphold the principles of democratic confederalism uh, that's really grounded in uh, commitment to feminist economics. And so these three are examples um, of models that are working at local scale, and of course, varying degrees of fidelity and success, but are ones that are often um, rallying and, and resisting against some of the dominant forces trying to shut them down. The name of the second uh, example? Uh, the, the Boston Ujima Project. U-J-I-M-A. OK. And we can share references in the chat mode. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the last thing I'll share is uh, actually one of the types of infrastructures that I've been working on with my team at one project 
uh, which is a tool for worker cooperatives, uh, something to bolster the empowerment and financial literacy of every worker owner in a one worker, one vote cooperative. Um, and so this is infrastructure that we might consider amongst a plurality of tools uh, that can support these kinds of alternative structures uh, in an effort to make them perhaps more resilient. So our economy is this living, evolving system, and uh, the projects that I've explored tries to exam try to examine how information flows and is ultimately processed within it. And this lens of information metabolism offers some deeper insights into how economic systems coordinate activity and allocate resources that I believe open up new possibilities for reimagining our economic relationships. And so this journey from critique to alternatives is ongoing and, and really requires continuous engagement and collaboration across disciplines. Uh, yet as artists, designers, researchers, and the general public, uh, we all play a role in shaping an economy that serves humanity and our planet. And so by questioning and exploring how our economic systems process information, uh, I believe that we can work toward a future where these systems evolve to meet uh, the needs of all. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, Raphael. That was, that was excellent, actually. And uh, let's move right away over to Jaromil in uh, the Amsterdam region. Thanks. Cheers. It was very interesting to follow. And uh, yeah, I hope to add something from the technical uh, angle, indeed, as uh, Richard mentioned uh, before. Um, first of all, I, I just like to introduce a little bit the background where I come from with my organization. Dynorg is, um, is an European nonprofit. Uh, we work as a free software foundry. So we do software, we don't do uh, services. Uh, we have lab now more than 20 years of expertise and uh, we do software because it has a value for its impact often software which is growing of importance uh, at uh, at uh, even too fast speed today software is uh, um, is made because it makes profit so this is probably 99 percent of the software made uh, commercially and um, we like to do the software that perhaps doesn't make a profit, but it really has an impact in society. And we believe that this impact, this positive externality uh, has, uh, has a value as well and uh, comes back to everyone working on it. We are inspired by the GNU project and the Free Software Foundation. We are very closely working with uh, them. We produce one of the 100% free uh, distributions that the FSF uh, recommends. And uh, yeah, it's not a mainstream one, Dynabolic, uh, but uh, yeah, believe it or not, the mainstream uh, GNU Linux distributions, they are not 100% free. Uh, so we take care into details and we are greatly inspired by these four main freedom concepts about software that are an important uh, uh, reference for uh, understanding also the rest of what I'm going to show you. Um, we don't stop to software in doing a software. We don't stop to, to technicalities or the technical process. So if you want uh, uh, to have a bird's eye view, uh, what we do is uh, divided into these four areas. There are three pillars uh, in our foundation. One is interdisciplinarity as a methodology. Uh, so involving artists, economists, philosophers, architects, um, ethnographers, uh, anthropologists, uh, when we do uh, something is very important and uh, we proceed by first analyzing the human side of things and then applying technology if it fits. And I think this is a very important course of action for technologists. Uh, so we try not to be solutionists and uh, the second pillar obviously is uh, uh, is free and open source software as a licensing. And the third is respecting the environment. And this means uh, looking at uh, how economies can be sustainable, but also very simply, it means at looking that our software can run on old machines, that you can recycle a computer and still run software. That software doesn't require 
you to buy a brand new machine. And I, we think this is a very simple concept. It has a high uh, high impact on the environment, and it's also it's also a passionate subject for technologists because it means you have to optimize your software uh, rather than throwing hardware at it. You have to really study how to make it run on uh, on machines that are older. Um, Digging deeper, these are like some of the, the roles that we take as a think-do tank, as we like to define our operations. And we work very closely, uh, obviously, being in Europe with the European uh, Commission, uh, that is uh, our main partner. We support these two campaigns within Europe. One is public money for public code. Obviously, uh, licensing is very important there. And another one connected uh, again to the environmental uh, uh, mission is to uh, make it possible to reuse, refurbish, repair. And this is a very important, successful campaign also in the US. So I'm very happy that we can uh, report some success. Public money for public code. Well, yeah, you know, open source is being very popular also among, among the big tech giants, uh, but it's not always the case for research projects. And uh, we do our best also in the cascade funding that we coach for the commission. So down to the code, if uh, anyone watching wants to see uh, what we do in practice, uh, this is our uh, one of the ways to, to navigate our code. Uh, we publish it on uh, GitHub and uh, on other uh, Git uh, repositories as well. And uh, yeah, have a stroll around and you'll see um, more on the institutional side, uh, we started as hackers, you should know, like 20 years ago, and now we have uh, uh, partnerships that span across the globe and uh, touch some uh, uh, also important institutions. And uh, this is just a, a quick and not updated map. We are uh, just joining uh, the W3C as we speak, an important standardization body that has always operated uh, within the boundaries of free and open source software. So we are happy to build bridges there. And um, by the way, uh, we are also opening a, a new community group there at W3C. So keep an eye out for our uh, labels there. Uh, more important, we work, as I mentioned, uh, among many people. This is an example, uh, the people behind the Interfacer project, which you can find online. It is a federated, uh, self-sovereign uh, um, repository for open source hardware designs that you can download there. And uh, this is a, a group picture with our partners from uh, uh, Germany and, uh, uh, and the Netherlands and Italy and Denmark that uh, uh, joined in into this project with uh, Fab City OS. So uh, I think the best touching point that uh, I have with the discussion, especially being about information, is uh, this project that we did for the European Commission back in 2016. Uh, it became a flagship project, so an example uh, that uh, for, for projects to come and also a, a building block for what has been later on the GDPR legislation, uh, the General Directive on uh, Privacy that the European Commission imposed on the usage of data uh, in Europe and uh, of Europeans uh, elsewhere. In this project, we pose uh, very simple questions and uh, they are about uh, who owns the data on which business is being done in cities. So we operate in the smart city concept and we want to reclaim the smart city. Um, why? Because cities are very dense settlements and uh, desire needs travel very fast in them. Uh, they, are, uh, they can be very populated. In this case, we worked with the city of Amsterdam and the city of Barcelona. So two major uh, cities, uh, high in tech and in, in, in flow of people in Europe. And uh, we ask, where it goes, all the money that is done with connecting desires in a city, like, you know, uh, companies uh, connecting people, demanding or and offering uh, things uh, like Uber or Airbnb or Tinder, you name it, people connecting, be, people being connected over needs and demands, they generate value if they are facilitated. But this value can be generated if the data is, uh, is available somehow. 
and um, we noticed that it was siloed through uh, you know big companies that uh, uh, profit over them, but also closed completely the the field, the playing field to other companies. In particular, in Europe, we didn't add entrants for uh, local companies. So uh, data that was local was actually exploited globally. And um, we try to look at ways to make data a uh, commons, uh, not really private data, but aggregated data, and anyway, uh, a conscious exchange of data as a commons on which to build new services that may be not only commercially oriented. So this was the origin of our uh, um, adventure, actually, with the European Commission. The One of the most recent projects, and you can see here the evolution of what we want to do in the space, was Reflow, uh, a success story. You can just scan the, the, the QR code. You will hear uh, the report by the European Commission um, about it. It was a, a 10 million project involving six cities this time, and we analyze a, the, the flow of material flows coming in and out of cities. Uh, this was very important to actually model a system that can trace the agency of resources uh, through events by agents. And so we work on a model that is a digital product passport that can trace uh, flows of value. We were, we've been very advanced with it and I'm happy to say we just published an open access uh, article on Springer uh, about uh, digital product passport and our journey applying the value flows vocabulary, which is a vocabulary that was developed in North America actually originally, and we work closely with the engineers that uh, uh, conceptualized it. So the journey was very interesting. We tried to uh, apply an existing vocabulary. Uh, we built only open source software. In this case, we use a stack that was originally uh, built by Ericsson. So we used uh, uh, languages that uh, is uh, the Erlang language and the Elixir stack. So a very performant stack on top of PostgreSQL to build a software that can serve the purpose of tracing, uh, tracing materials, tracing stuff. So the story can be very long and, and I will not go in detail, but I will. I want to um, stay still on the theoretical here and uh, let you understand one thing, that in these projects we work on uh, fairly complex setups to allow people to govern the data. And this complexity bites us all the time. Whether it's used against us or for us, Algorithms, the complexity of algorithms is something that is subjugating people, especially when they don't understand, when we don't understand them. So they can be used as, as you see in this artwork by Pavel Kuczynski that I love very much because it's, uh, it, it gives you immediately the idea of the phenomenon of uh, Pokemon Go. It uh, just uh, uh, creates it can, an algorithm and, and a currency system, a reward system can create an incentive that is immediate and it's uh, addictive and can actually bring people to do things that are nonsensical, like crossing railroads or or or, uh, or floating a place or the entrance of, of uh, public places looking for incentives. incentives. So where I'm going here is uh, um, connecting the algorithms with the data. And what I'm pointing at is the complexity of, uh, of these systems. I think that uh, uh, the next steps that we need to do are in taming down this complexity because, and here I come with the interdisciplinarity, because we need more people hands-on on these systems. Because uh, the technocracy that is built around the building of algorithms that is, uh, that is uh, uh, actually empowered by the knowledge of algorithms is the mal du siècle, if you like, the, the real enemy right now. We have uh, an enclave of technologists that know code and, uh, well, uh, we can make people understand better code, but we can also make code better understandable. So here I pose a fundamental question here <laughs> that is philosophical, and it's uh, for all the technologists that are listening. What are we developing the tools we do for? 
Are we developing them so that machines understand humans or so that humans understand machines? I believe that most of the profitable work right now is to make machines understand humans. And I posed this question well before the large language models hype that is called AI nowadays. So I believe that it is a more ethical step. Perhaps it needs some sacrifice uh, nowadays, but it will bring a, a great success in, in terms of uh, serving society that we have technologies that are understandable, that are deterministic, perhaps. So here I am already uh, launching a, a, a bullet against the, the AI hype, the artificial intelligence hype, because we are talking there about technology that is mostly non-deterministic, cannot be demonstrated that an input led to an output. Uh, there are many aspects uh, that we need to take into account when answering this question, but the fundamental one is uh, at the end, who we want to be in charge. As a practical solution, I worked uh, in the past, uh, now uh, 2018, it was like six years now. This is a project that is version four to a virtual machine that ac can execute uh, cryptographic operations expressed in human-like language. It is uh, called Zenroom. It's of course open source. You can download it and run it pretty much on every computer, Windows, Apple, uh, GNU Linux, as well into a browser, and you can fit it into a chip. The virtual machine is two megabytes of payload and operates in less than two megabytes of RAM. It's very tiny, it's ready also for IoT. How it looks like the language, you see on the left uh, code that is processed by Zenroom, and on the right, you see the algorithm expressed in, in a sort of Mathematica uh, dialect language. And um, on the left, you see how it's done, this code. It uh, borrows some ideas from uh, Prolog, so from logical programming, but it really is a dialect of Gherkin, uh, also known as Cucumber, which is a domain-specific language for behavioral-driven development, which was used by the industry in the last uh, more than 20 years for building test units. So for verifying that the software is doing what it's supposed to do which is not obvious <laughs> because the complexity of uh, writing software is high. So it uh, uh, be a uh, human mistake, uh, be it communication overhead. Uh, in my experience as a software architect, I, I must say communication overhead is uh, huge. When you have a domain expert, you have someone that has researched a field for more than 10 years and knows what goes where in business could be someone expert of a business logic that knows where the, per the percentages fall and how to cut the pie. And this can be very complex because uh, imagine, uh, uh, imagine a, a system in which you have, uh, um, oh, pardon, I have to connect the battery here. Yeah. Imagine a system where you have a grid, an energy grid, and you are producing a plus for the energy grid and you are selling it back. There are so many things to take care for and uh, parts of infrastructure that needs to be rewarded when used. So these are very complex systems and sometimes they change from one place to another. So this is what I call domain knowledge. Domain expertise can be so complex and then you have to communicate it to programmers that are able to put it into code. So this communication overhead is enormous. And um, I believe that most of the big firmas of tech with uh, agile inceptions and whatnot, they work more around this than to write code, which is mostly 20, 30% of the work at the end. So you see, when you empower people to express themselves better, and uh, give orders to machine, you can make it much easier to develop technology that serves humans. So this is the gist of what I wanted to say. Uh, Richard, you know my work for longer and you know that I've been involved in a complementary currency development. So I like to, to draw a tie also there. 
uh, I had the honor to work with people like Bernard Lietaire, Margaret Kennedy. We lost many big thinker, thinkers in the sphere of complementary currency. And of course, uh, uh, you, you quote Keynes. So that is a great inspiration for uh, many things we do. Uh, one of the articles I mentioned uh, in Springer is really a readaptation of Keynes concepts for the economy of uh, fab cities and fab labs. Uh, what I like to say is that uh, what you see here as a product, as a tool for doing cryptography is uh, uh, definitely developed because uh, all the complexity that I have seen people have to face when dealing with uh, a wallet, just a wallet. That is not what we are used to. It's not like where we put cash in, but it's a mobile phone that is connected and can translate and can withdraw or deposit. All this sort of complexity is enormous and it is overwhelming and it's also a big responsibility. So what I went from the social wallet research uh, that someone may have heard also like uh, we did uh, 10 years ago, we went to develop cryptographic tools that empower known coders to develop their own way to deal with the economy. So this is a meta level, let's say. I am uh, totally with Bernard Littire when uh, thinking that the future, it is a resilient ecology of currencies and of values. And values must be contextualized um, in, in terms of communities and, and they must be appropriated. So in, in this scenario, I believe that uh, the, the way to best provide people with technology is not to sell them or make them adopt a wallet, but to give them tool to create their own uh, value uh, flows. Thank you. Thank you, Jaromil. Thank you. And uh, just on your last uh, statements here about uh, giving users the opportunity and the, and the ingredients and the uh, and and the rights to be involved in this way requires a tremendous uh, change in our uh, education and educational systems i think uh, uh, most of society is not prepared for these next uh, steps these next iterations that we think might be a healthier approach to mm -hmm. our economic future any thoughts on on that how do we prepare a populace to really be be responsible participants? It's uh, difficult. Um, I believe, again, involving uh, more people. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get out of this, uh, you know, Prometheus view that, uh, uh, you know, as a technologist, uh, you provide the tools, even like my tool, as it can be useful. At the end, uh, communicating this problem to more people that are on the field, uh, communi communicating the right problems and offering opportunities actually to build a sustainable act activity to solve the problem, uh, that is the right way to go. And it's this is not a, an answer about technology. So ultimately, uh, what you mentioned can be solved if you, you know, as I do it, I can tell you about my experience. Uh, I, I take domain experts that have brilliant ideas about, again, I work with uh, energy grid uh, uh, startups that try to build, uh, uh, you know, the Rifkin uh, beautiful idea of uh, sustainable communities and energy communities. And uh, these domain experts need to be empowered with tools. And uh, they, they, will, they will solve it their own way. They, their interaction with the communities is so complex and far away from my comprehension that um, a language perhaps for them to talk with machines or with us uh, developers is all what we need. And uh, I believe that the, the, the future solutions are beyond my, my comprehension. Thanks. Uh, Rafael Vangelis, any uh, thoughts on what's transpired uh, in the first uh, little over an hour now, and we have about a half hour to go if we want it. Uh, so any thoughts, any discussion, any 
uh, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, as a planner, I, I immediately always think about steps forward. How do you, you know, what are the step-by-step -step, uh, formula for moving these concepts, these ideas, these actualizations forward? Vangelis, what are next steps in your efforts? Bridges. Bridges. Breathing? Bridges. 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 Yes. Bridges. Bridging. Uh -huh. Between? Bridges. Between what? Coordination tools. Okay. We need to, 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 to bridge uh, 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 different uh, um, projects and initiatives into an ecosystem. We need uh, to, to create a decentralized counter-hegemony, post-hegemony to change uh, the, the system from, uh, from, the bottom, uh, from the bottom up. When we need coordination tools, all the work that uh, Dennis is uh, doing, he's been doing in the last uh, years, uh, somehow to to plug it uh, into more and more and more and uh, to multiply all these uh, stuff together into, into tools for the communities to use, to, to apply, to educate themselves and to, to change the system. <laughs> Raphael, you, you earlier mentioned uh, ways to intervene in the system. Uh, Donella Meadows' concept uh any thoughts about these methods of intervention i think i mean the question you raised to uh denise or yaramil was was really interesting of like where do where do we start and perhaps i'm a materialist so i think if you appeal to people's material reality then you can perhaps get an ideological shift so i think there is a benefit in having tooling or ideas that are readily available and prototyping that impact and appeal to people's immediate material needs. Um, so I think that's something quite interesting about complementary currencies or local currencies in the sense of like, if you are cash strapped and you are broke, but you have this other way of tapping in and getting your needs met, that actually creates a structure and a pathway for you to perhaps have an ideological shift and a shift in perspective, which then can have uh, some kind of domino effect. And so I think there's benefit to having all sorts of these prefigurative experiments. I think the challenge ends up happening is that a lot of the prefigurative experiments end up uh, being under threat by the dominant status quo who is interested in keeping things the kind of way that they are um, with a certain value set or ideology, ideology of neoliberalism, and the kinds of things that Vangelis pointed out in that wonderful table that you had of like, here are the, the kind of components of neoliberalism with individualism, et cetera, and here are the components of calming. Um, so that's kind of my, my perspective on things, which is why I believe in a lot of this socio-technical infrastructure plays that can end up having some impact. Um, I'll leave it at that though. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded, I may have told this before in one of our other sessions, but uh, uh, just uh, at the be beginning of the public internet age in 92, 93, I was invited uh, uh, by a man named Hal Varian, uh, who is now chief economist Google. Uh, Hal was a professor at Berkeley. He was elsewhere before that. He was an early internet economist. Um, and he invited me to a meeting at the Department of Commerce in Washington, D.C., uh, in I think it was 93. And uh, the, the topic of that meeting at Commerce in Washington was, uh, what is the new digital economy? Uh, and there were government bureaucrats there, there were corporate representatives, and there were academics, primarily. And uh, I was quite naively hopeful that the concept of uh, information, communications, uh, digital uh, processes um, might really uh, open up 
thinking, uh, open their minds about what we mean when we talk about economic processes. Uh, but at the end of two days of that meeting, uh, the, the main uh, organizers said, oh, this has been a very productive meeting uh, and uh, our decisions are, are going to be very easy because um, information is property. <laughs> and uh, and it is uh, to be regulated and uh, governed by government, uh, owned and developed by corporations, and uh, the public are renters, uh, sub monthly subscriptions, et cetera, information as property. I, I was devastated by that. I think I screamed at the back of the room <laughs> at that concept. Uh, and yet that's a very dominant one in our society here, um, which is uh, a very dangerous course over time, a very dangerous and deeply concerning one. Um, and, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I'm really interested personally in, in the concepts I hear in Telluride many years ago, uh, uh, we created, uh, a project I, I led here, uh, called the Info Zone, um, which made Telluride the first rural community in the world with a dedicated internet pop, uh, free accounts to everybody. Luckily, because we were early, we got a lot of uh, technical support and so on. Uh, but uh, it revolution. Uh, this community still speaks about what the info zone did to really transform uh, the schools and education, the library, uh, the local museum. Uh, we're sitting in the library, which was one of the first digitally connected libraries in a non-urban environment. This community at that time had under two thousand people. Uh, an ideal test bed actually uh, for doing things. And uh, um, and we're very far from that today. I mean, those kind of concepts have really been marginalized, uh, which concerns me uh, because of our, I think the good work that you are doing, that we're doing this uh, exploration uh, and uh, essentially a series of ongoing demonstration projects that are part of a learning environment. Uh, we're, we're, we're creating a learning environment uh, that has actualization at various stages. Um, any thoughts about just the process of moving forward and some of the things you're doing next? Or is that just too general? No, it, it strikes a chord uh, and the info zone is indeed uh, uh, a very good uh, reference and milestone uh, uh, in uh, in uh, the Netherlands. We had uh, the uh, digital start uh, and um, in Italy, we had some BBS uh, movements. I was also part on, like you remember, pre-internet and uh, we uh, campaigned, uh, we lost, uh, but we campaigned for providing uh, citizens with uh, free email uh, given by the town hall, uh, which, which gives you an idea of, of uh, the mentality that we had. We thought that uh, the infrastructure as communication infrastructure should be a public good. Um, fast forward, uh, UN, well, symbolically declared the internet a uh, human right. It's mostly symbolical nowadays. Okay, yeah, we have uh, Wi-Fi, we have connectivity for everyone, but what runs on it is uh, is not obvious. And uh, I believe uh, what is coming on in the future is a uh, contested ground on uh, uh, on identity and authentication, because uh, obviously uh, after the advent of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain was GIST is you can actually authenticate things online. We can make, you can make digital assets unique that we like it or not. This was a, a big revolution in the way information is conceived uh, in the digital dimension. So now there will be a race to authenticate and to mark identities. So there are new standards. Uh, the US has done uh, already a pilot with the driving licenses uh, that are uh, digital in uh, Europe uh, uh, there is work being done 
on the new European standard for identification systems and verifiable credentials. And uh, I think that this is the ground in which uh, we should be entering and we have entered the discourse, the discussion to make sure that these standards are interoperable, that they do not reproduce another pyramid like uh, SSL was for web browsers. Uh, to apply uh, wisdom that has been uh, largely developed in groups like uh, Web of Trust uh, by people uh, like Christopher Allen, uh, the people that have developed uh, the distributed identity systems at W3C. Uh, so we need to uh, take this, this uh, wealth of, uh, of visions and work, progressive visions, and make them flourish. I'm not sure we will be able to, I see a lot of institutional uh, resistance to this. I see a lot of fear uh, in good faith. I see people that fear decentralization in the old uh, school institutions. And uh, we need to make them understand why interoperability is important, why identity should not be released by one single uh, point of failure, why revocation of identity should not be at the push of a button I make you simple examples. Right now, uh, uh, most theories in Europe are about having uh, an identity wallet with a revocation system that is anonymous and can be revoked by a central institution. But imagine that someone like Orban gets uh, uh, elected in uh, Hungary and uh, a journalist writes things that Orban doesn't like, and he has a one kill switch that can revoke the driving license, the ID of this journalist without even finding where he or she is. So ruin someone's life without any revision. So there you see that we need to enter the space and advocate for threshold revocation. We need to have a peer-based uh, uh, stakeholder system that doesn't allow one issuer to revoke, but we need a review system in case we could call in the Association of Journalists to review the revocation of anything that has to do with journalists in our country. And uh, I'm making this example just to give you an idea of how political is this. It is techno-politics. And uh, we need to take back to these theories that Armin Medos has been uh, talking about and all the, the good people in Vienna, uh, Felix Staller, and uh, all the people that are writing about these things. And we need to bring them forward to the institutions or we will lose them. And then we will go just lunar punk as some people are doing. I don't blame them for this and just lose completely all hope in the institutions, which uh, young people are very good at. But growing older, you know, there's drawbacks. And uh, personally, I do want the institutions I, I, I live in to be better, to improve and to understand what I'm talking about. Anyone? One, one of the concerns that's come up in some of the other uh, uh, Zooms we've just been doing this week um, is the whole area of... Uh, back to philosophy in a way, uh, to digital logic, uh, binary Boolean approaches to information processing, which uh, has, has become dominant, a dominant uh, imposition, not just on technological development, but on social processes. Unfortunately, I think digital logic is having a real uh, uh, concerning impact on how uh, on, on the nature of bureaucracy uh, greatly, and on uh, also um, those who are not prepared to understand some of these concepts and who feel uh, increasingly um, the burden of information overload, uh, too much information, which is causing a backlash uh, of uh ignorance of people ignoring and closing their minds uh, increasingly. And that's affecting our politics very obviously, but also all kinds of social processes, including our education, uh, where uh, people are uh, really uh, reverting to beliefs rather than attempted understandings. And uh, also to um, 
having this digital, uh, this binary understanding of the world of uh, things are good or bad, us or them, uh, and et cetera, uh, which uh, one of the things that's, that's fascinating to me technologically is uh, I think our move into what in a previous session I've called uh, the photonic era, uh, photonics and the use of light, photons rather than electrons in our technological processes, uh, portends, and especially into quantum computing and so on. Uh, but photonics really uh, requires a different form of logic. It actually portends a new analog, not the own, old analog and a hybrid digital analog potentially in terms. And I wonder about how uh, probability a key word in quantum processing, really uh, becomes part of a social uh, logic and, and part of how we change thinking from on, off, either, or, you, me, good, bad, uh, to really seeing the, the well of nuance and gray areas or colors uh, that, that are our real surrounds and ourselves, in fact. Raphael? I mean, I think you said, it, you said it right there at the end. The, the point that I think is missing is the p are pieces around nuance and nuance and I think criticality and an open mindedness. And, um, you know, from a from kind of a technologist design perspective, I feel like that's um, we have a lot of these the platforms to blame in terms of the way that information is presented in a certain manner of right, wrong, yes, no. Um, these kinds of curated feeds, um, oftentimes that they're not, they're not actually trying to highlight nuance. Um, I don't know, something I've been thinking a lot about is the opportunity of, in this AI boom, to actually try and surface some of the nuance uh, in the ways that we are receiving information on, whether it's social media platforms or, or throughout, of just being like, how are you actually using large language models or AI in a way of not not force feeding or spoon feeding what one should think, but raising critical questions as to what a source or a particular piece of information has not considered or left out. Um, that's kind of an open question and something I'm very curious about, um, worth exploring. Yeah, in the process of uh, getting from here to there, uh, even as at the at where we are right now, there's a world that is uh, highly inequitable, uh, great variation in in inequities, uh, and and that's inherent in this intermediary stage of where we're coming from and where we're trying. Some of us are trying to move toward. Uh, how do we become more inclusive? in these processes and and it, by their very nature uh the this notion of the commons is uh attempts to be inclusive it's inherent in that way of thinking um any thoughts we have a few minutes before we wind this up so i just want to not stop too soon but give you an opportunity for a few additional comments thoughts questions well, uh, if I may be a bit uh, provocative, I come from the field of uh, philosophy. I have studied philosophy. I have taught philosophy at the university. I come from the field of political theory, etc. So I think that, um, to put it uh, bluntly, uh, there is no technology, or there is no, there is no. Uh, 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 um, logic is a combination of symbols and how we use uh, symbols. There, there is a, all there is out there is matter and energy, and we are part of matter and energy, and we interact uh, with matter and uh, energy. So behind the technology and behind the, uh, any digital logic is is ethics, algorithms like uh, Danny Dennis is working on, is the design. How we design is normativity. Is what we do with the technology. Is what we we we, we do with logic. Is is so essentially uh, is um, uh, 
is the feelings, what we want to do with our, our morality. With, uh, it is the moral values that constitute our society. And we need to reconsider these, uh, these, uh, these values and this is something uh, difficult because the, there is people uh, uh, value different things differently. So we need to somehow find uh, uh, commonalities uh, 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 with each other. Um, so I think I will stop here. Jaromil, anything? I think I, I talk already uh, too much. I found very interesting <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I agree with Vangelis, we need bridges. <laughs> um and uh yeah it's it's fun to build uh, and we need to bridge uh, across uh, domains of knowledge uh, i think uh, i find very inspiring uh, all the laser talks uh, you're in, in, involved in uh, richard uh, it is definitely uh, a huge bridge it's like a network of bridges so um i think uh, you're doing a great uh, uh, job in this direction and i'll be watching all the talks when the recordings are out thank you thanks any final words Raphael? before we wind this up well just plus one to bridges um i think it's important to also not only be sharing ideas but also engaging in practice and so that's that's really one that I'm honing in on and trying to anchor on next is how are, how are we actually, it's one thing to share ideas and thoughts and knowledge. It's another thing to actually get involved and hands-on and engage in the process of co-creation and co-making and, and actually trying some of these ideas out because um, theory can die in theory land and it's important to bridge to practice. And that was actually the basis for inviting the three of you. You are uh, not just theorists, but you're example setters, you're experimenters, you're uh, involved in doing, not just thinking. And so uh, I thank you for your efforts. I thank you for participating today in this little uh, hour and a half discussion and presentation. Thank you very much. The, the economic sphere of the information society is a critically complex and yet uh, critically important part of our future. Uh, a lot of work to be done, a lot of controversy, uh, and hopefully a lot of uh, public good. So thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.